So yes, uh, Kurt and I are going to get together and kind of tag team this presentation. The uh, title of our presentation is Video Platforms, a Missing Ingredient. So we're going to talk about how to optimize and uh, kind of deliver the best OTT experience from maybe a content owner or OTT platform uh, perspective. Okay, now I'm live. Um, but first we're going to handle the boring stuff first and do a bit of the introductions. So again, I'm Howard Brooks. I'm a director of sales for Broadpeak. I cover everything in the US for Broadpeak for sales and business development activities outside of the cable space. So that leaves me dealing with media companies, uh, OTT platform operators, telcos, satellite providers, and the like. Um, I'm actually relatively new to Broadpeak. I've been there like three months maybe. But I've known the company since its inception. And I've been in the space for maybe 20 years working at a variety of encoding vendors. Um, a bit about Broadpeak, uh, it's an eight-year-old spin-off from Technicolor. Um, it's a French company headquartered in France, but uh, has been dealing with carrier class platforms since its very beginning. When it spun out of Technicolor, it took uh, VOD and IPTV VOD server technology uh, with it and quickly got into the OTT game when ABR and OTT technology really became uh, very prevalent in the marketplace. Um, you know, so most of our customers started off being telco providers and, and major content providers. We're a leading innovator. Um, we like to work with leading innovators like Sea Change, and that's why we're here today. We've got a very wide ecosystem of partners that we work with, many different CMS providers, DRM providers, players, set-top boxes, encoding vendors, and the like. Uh, we're a software company. Everything we do is based on software can be deployed as a software license and then with an annual service contract or as a service in a cloud environment. Uh, best of breed, we've got 40 R&D engineers in France developing these solutions every day, uh, coming up with the best you know, products we think or some of the best products in the marketplace. And of course, we've got 24 by seven support around the sun support. The support center for the US happens to be in Denver. So again, we're a media delivery and technology software and services provider. We provide multi-screen uh, video delivery solutions like origin servers, uh, packagers, uh, and the like. We do cloud PVR, circular buffer uh, records, uh, basically an entire CDN toolkit, including caching uh, uh, tools as well. We have some CDN selection and diversity tools, and along the way we provide great technology like multicast ABR and some analytics. Some key figures about us, we have about 2,000 petabytes of video stream monthly on our platforms. 150 million end uh, users uh, are supported by our platforms, eight terabytes of installed streaming capacity, and uh, 80, 80, 70 to 80 plus customers. Our latest customer uh, we announced at uh, the NAB was HBO Latin America, where we deployed some caching solutions for them um, to solve problems uh, in the market. And then also probably our oldest customer is Orange, major telco in, in Europe that's basically bought everything that we provide. Um, so that's the boring introduction part. Um, Kurt will do his not boring sea change introduction, and uh, then we'll get into the technology optimizations and the missing ingredients of great OTT platforms. There you go, Kurt. Thanks, Howard. Sea <clears throat> um, change. Uh, I've been with Sea Change since October. Sea uh, change, 25 years old this year. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Sea Change in the past, uh, and maybe some of you haven't. Um, you know, we do a dramatic amount of traffic every day, uh, 10 million sessions served daily, uh, serving 40 million subscribers daily, 50 million ads daily. We have over 200 customers, primarily in the cable and telco, um, you know, IP TV type cable TV space. Um, and you, you know you can see the various uh, company logos at the bottom there. Um, but one of the things I think that people haven't heard before is really, you know, what is Sea Change about? What Sea Change's focus? And I think that the top line here is really what what we're about. It's a video management software which empowers video service providers. And I think I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea behind you know, where we're thinking and where we focus as I go through my presentation. Um, first of all, let's talk about provider challenges. Okay, okay, you've heard this. Every presentation starts off with this. But I'm going to go through a good, bad, and ugly scenario. So the good, um, 
the good news is, wow, there's a lot of viewers out there and there's new ways to uh, get to them. Um, the possible opportunities for engagement, the possible opportunities for advertising, for targeted advertising, for be able, being able to you know, give people what they want when they want it. The opportunities are almost endless. Um, the other advantage is there's new opportunities to build relationships with your viewers. If you have subscription services, your subscribers. Uh, and those relationships will be very powerful, right? They become, your, your consumer becomes very sticky. Uh, the more you know about them, the better you can target and position things for them. Is that me? Uh, so along with the good, is the bad. So you've got, in order to basically realize all those advantages, the complexities are just ginormous. It, if I look at the amount of innovation that comes out every year, the new capabilities, the new technologies, and now with the AI and the machine learning, and people are saying, well, look at now what's possible. Okay, but there's a big difference between what's possible and what is realistically implementable. Um, and you know that's a really big challenge. Also, competitive threats. So the people who have been traditionally in the video business, um, and I mean television business and all kinds of video, um, they're now seeing new competition come in as the, bar as the internet has lowered the barriers for people to go direct to consumer. As a result, they're seeing increased viewer churn. And how do you fight viewer churn? Well, you have to make sure that the experience that your viewer is getting is better than what the next guy can give them. What's the ugly? <laughs> well, disruption, right? It's business model upheaval. It's the acceleration of technology. It's how do we keep up in this ever-changing world? Uh, today's video is very different, I think. Even, even from a couple of years ago, I noticed you know, the amount of buffering. A couple of years ago, I was talking about something called uh, uh, buffer rage and how much buffering was creating issues. And I think, you know, as I have watched more and more video, I'm finding that maybe it's not so bad, or at least not as bad as it used to be. So I think we're getting on top of these problems. We're meeting the challenges, but we're going to keep on facing new ones. Let's talk about history a little bit. I'm going to take a little bit of a segue here and talk about sort of where we are in video and uh, you know, give you some perspective. How many of you, I'm, I'm showing you uh, what, Amigas, Commodore 64, Trash 80s, Apple IIs. How many of you remember or even had uh, one of these machines? Oh, we got a good room full of here. <laughs> All right, so what the heck does this have to do with video? Okay, so I mean, these were machines at the dawn of the personal computer age, right? They were for hobbyists and experts. I mean, the true professional experts were sitting on mainframes, right? They were working for places like IBM. But, you know, the hobbyists who were really smart, this is what they did, homebrew computers. Um, these machines, they ran platform-specific programs. They, for the most part, had platform-specific hardware. The idea of plugging in cards from multiple vendors and things, that was way off in the distant future. Limited software reuse, meaning that an application was written for a particular machine. And we didn't really call them applications then. We called them programs. And a program was designed to run on a particular machine. And if it got popular, you know, the, the provider might write that program for another machine. But for the most part, the programs were siloed. They sat on a particular platform. Um, extensibility in terms of, you know, adding on new features and capabilities to these machines, uh, it was... Um, complicated and limited because each ecosystem sort of stood on its own. And because of that, 
I would say that everyone was redesigning the wheel. Okay, so a lot of people were just sort of picking their silo based on whatever market share uh, information or just you know what they happen to like, and they were spending their time. But a lot of people were redesigning the same capabilities on different platforms. And when you have an ecosystem like this, you have a lot of cost and a lot of inefficiency. So then what happened? The sides formed. We ended up with the uh, IBM started up the personal computer. Apple went to the Macintosh. Um, and they were really built on sort of two concepts. One, the PC was built on, I, I wouldn't say open per se, but a more open construct. And the idea that there were a lot of businesses and people uh, basically an ecosystem that formed around the PC. Whereas the Macintosh and the variants beyond that were uh, more closed. Um, you couldn't just go out and buy an Apple operating system and put it on hardware. You had to buy the Apple experience, the whole box. Um, and we've seen this, this same story told uh, multiple times, right? We, I mean, we're living it right now with uh, mobile phones, right? Open versus closed. Um, the advantage, of course, to the open PC world is generally better application availability, right? Because there's a larger group. And I think if you talk to anybody in the gamer community, they would tell you if you're a gamer, you're on the PC platform, even today. I mean, there's certain games that are available on the Mac uh, that might be better. They might even run better or do certain things better. But in terms of software availability, game availability, um, the PC platform is you know, a more preferred there's a rich ecosystem of suppliers, vendors, uh, cards, graphics cards, et cetera, et cetera. And um, because of that, it's because of that that scale economies and lower cost were made possible. Today, if you look at an equivalent um, PC laptop versus a Macintosh laptop, you're going to pay substantially more for effectively the same compute and processing power just based on the spec sheet. And we're not going to get into the elegance of the operating system or any of that here. Um, so now that we've looked at that and you, and you kind of understand where the PC industry went, I want to take another little bit of a segue into sort of distinguishing planes, plane distinction thinking from the perspective of video. Um, your video comes into your system. And this is, you know, I've been doing this for a bit with a couple companies now. And we always have the same diagram. We have the content ingestion. And then we go into the, you know, you, you get the data, you sort it, you do modification, metadata tagging, all of that. Then we get into, OK, now you publish it to an origin. And from that origin, now it's available to all the CDNs. Uh, and, but before you actually put it in front of the customer, now we actually have to do the merchandising, right? So the technology of getting it into the origin is only the beginning. After that, it's about how do I position it? How do I price it? How do I manage uh, the metadata and merge the metadata around the content coming together with the information that we're getting about the particular subscriber or the uh, contextual information about the time of day where that subscriber is and what they might be doing and is it a weekend or a weekday. Lots of things that can affect you know, what you want to do. And then there's the presentation to the viewer itself and the monetization. Uh, the statistics gathering, cycling all that back in so that you now have a more complete picture of your subscriber for the next time that you're going to do that. And as I say, we've all seen that. And this is really about the data plane, right? I, a lot of people have been thinking and optimizing and economizing around the data plane processing of video. But there's another aspect to this 
there's the management of the content. So yes, you can acquire the video, you can sort it, modify it, tag it. Um, yes, you can package it, price it, but you need a way to do that and manage that whole process. And finally, you need a way to manage the viewer experience. And so the place we don't really talk about all that much is the control and management plane of this whole thing. All right, we've been so focused on the aspects of streaming and the technology involved in streaming that we really haven't thought so much about the control and management, which really goes to who are you talking to, who are you presenting to, what are you going to put in front of them, when are you going to do that, and where. And when I say where, I'm talking about on what device. Where, where could the subscriber be? Are they on a train platform waiting on their commute this morning, or are they you know, sitting down for a night's uh, TV? Um, that's all really important information now as we get into this age of personalization. So video platforms today, and I like to say this is deja vu all over again, uh, Yogi Berra. Um, <clears throat> We have data plane infrastructure building blocks, really powerful things. I see uh, AWS come in and they've got all these little widgets and blocks and you can put them all together and it's really great and you can create some awesome services. And you can run things, these, these widgets and things and capabilities are available for managed and unmanaged cloud-based infrastructure, in-house infrastructure and even hybrids. And we've been talking about all of that. But again, a lot of that is based on the idea of that data plane, right? Where do I do my data plane? Um, if we think about where we are today, I would argue that we're probably looking like that homebrew Amiga Commodore 64 days. And the video platforms that are being used by service providers today are being built up, purpose built from the ground up. And they may be on clouds and they may use common pieces from the data plane, but in fact, from the control and management aspects of it, they are all islands unto themselves. And I would add to the providers A, B, and C I show here, if you think about people like Netflix and people like Comcast's X1 platform, okay? Arguably some of the most advanced platforms they are not open platforms, they are closed platforms. And so the question is, are we doing all of this as efficiently as possible as an industry, or is there more efficiency to be had by scale? Um, I would argue that the open PC-like alternative doesn't exist today. And why does it not exist today? Um, I think the missing ingredient is the fact that it, we haven't really discovered or broken down what those control plane elements are. All right, so if we look at you know, the PC world and the different data cards and element, you know, the hardware things that you can plug in and then drivers and all that, that became a very rich ecosystem, lots of competition, lots of innovation. But there was always a common ingredient, a common baseline of capabilities and services that that PC was going to support. Um, and I think what we're missing today are the cohesive management building blocks, the things that every provider does need, right? Content and metadata management, super rich metadata management. Uh, and not just on metadata that's coming in with the content, but on pulling metadata in to attach to that content from a variety of other sources dynamically. Right? The fact that there's an actor or an actress in a movie and something happens that's highly topical becomes very interesting metadata when we're trying to analyze what kind of offers we're going to make to people, to our, to our viewers, um, you know, tomorrow. There's the offer transaction and session management. So, you know, when I'm, I'm sitting down and I'm trying to figure out what am I going to put in front of my customer, my viewer, tomorrow? Or which viewer? Every viewer maybe wants a different thing. We're talking about, you know, a market of one at this point. So, personalization. 
how do we define what the offer looks like? And is the offer different at 7 a.m. versus what they're going to be presented with at 9 p.m.? Um, management in terms of now there's advertising uh, content. And that's yet another piece of content, right? And you have to figure out who you're going to put that in front of. And then there's a consistent uh, user experience, presentation management that goes across all the various platforms that the user is going to want. So I would say that the missing ingredient is exactly this. It's um, sort of a set of control and management plane tools uh, that can provide sort of the glue between what providers want to actually do and the people who are actually creating the offers and you know, targeting the subscribers and the underlying uh, mechanisms. Um, and I would go so far as to say that that, that layer should be able to work network agnostic. So whether or not your subscriber happens to be on, um, you know, on a QAM-based network, an IPTV network, or OTT managed, unmanaged, it shouldn't matter because from the operator's point of view, it's all video getting to viewers. And I think that's where we should be thinking at this point in the industry. Um, so provider framework really is just uh, my view uh, of those four elements that I talked about, plus third-party add-ons. So there was machine learning, AI. Uh, we're hearing a lot about that. Um, and who knows what's to come, right? Uh, and then sort of drivers underneath that for the data plane. And um, again, you know, transparent across a variety of things. But there is another missing ingredient. It's not just that. The other missing ingredient, the thing that's really required is partnerships. And those partnerships would drive towards pre-integration, or what I would call a reference design for the thing that I'm talking about. And with that, I'd like to have Howard come up and talk about Broadbeat. Thank you. So yeah, reference designs are key having you know, something you can deploy a cookie cutter and go out there into the marketplace and deploy ecosystems that work well together is, is, is key. Going back to the beginning of the presentation, we were talking about making uh, optimizations and what's the missing ingredient. So I'd like to bring it back and talk about that data plane where really Broadpeak plays and is more of a domain expert. And um, you know, kind of first set the table in terms of looking at what an off-net delivery network looks like. You know, most of us in this room probably know it, but it wouldn't, wouldn't hurt just to take a step back and, and define it and define what happens in it. Then I'd like to talk about some of the obstacles that uh, content providers and OTT providers face when they're kind of dealing with that off-net video delivery network. And then I'd like to call out maybe four optimizations that uh, can, can make things better, can make things work uh, more cohesively across that off-net delivery network. And surprisingly enough, I've heard a lot of them already mentioned in some of the other presentations that I've heard today that have all been pretty good. So I'll kind of run through some of those and then we'll wrap it up. So on this slide, I've got a pretty simplistic graphical representation of what an off-net video delivery network is. And for me, you know, off-net says it all. You're using somebody else's network to deliver your content to your end subscribers. And that's an extremely powerful thing. It's also a pretty scary thing. And again, it comes with a lot of challenges. I mean, you're basically using the World Wide Web to deliver content to subscribers that could be anywhere. Um, so, I mean, we all kind of know what that is in this room, but uh, it doesn't hurt to kind of, you know, call it out for what it is. Um, and Kirk kind of broke out the con control plane on the top and the data plane or the video delivery network on the bottom, and I'll kind of stick to those uh, definitions. Um, on the top, we've got this service platform in this diagram, and that's where folks like C-Change reside, providing CMS solutions, billing server solutions, uh, ways to come up with packages for you know, consumers, web services portals, all that goodness kind of sits in the control plane. And uh, we're not a domain expert there. We like to work with domain experts there. But uh, there's just a whole lot to go on, and, and you know, it's a whole different area to talk about. On the off-net video delivery and, and delivery chain, there's a lot of challenges that people face. And again, it's coming from using other networks. 
to get video from your, you know, from your head end, from that live or VOD content where you're originating, to the end subscriber, you basically have to go through four major steps. The head end, which you potentially might control, a CDN, uh, the network service provider's network, providing that last mile. And then finally, the home network, which isn't always without challenges in and of itself. Um, so the first step of that chain is the head end, and content owners often have some control in this area, often it's their head end. It's either at their facility, their data center, or maybe it's a cloud instance, public or private, that they've deployed. In that area, you're gonna have some kind of level of encoding or transcoding taking place, some level of content protection, some level of storage, maybe it's VOD content, maybe it's ad content, whatever, uh, and maybe some external origin uh, going on. From your head end, from your facility that you control, whether it's real or virtual in the cloud, the first step to get your content to your subscribers at that network service provider last mile network are the CDNs. So you're gonna find folks like Akamai and Level 3, Limelight, great companies that have really pioneered the CDN space in this area. Uh, the operator network, the network service provider, it's who your subscriber is using for that last mile. Maybe that's Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, maybe it's a mobile operator like T-Mobile or Sprint, uh, but they have a very critical part to play and they're not working for you, they're working with you. And then finally at the home network, you're gonna face some challenges, whether it's the home network or it's uh, some device, some mobile device that somebody has got on a subway or train, a plane, or wherever. Um, so throughout all these different aspects of the off-net video delivery uh, network, um, it, you know, there's challenges, there's software modules that can be deployed to help facilitate that um, or optimize it. You know, my company makes some of them, they're illustrated in blue here, but uh, you know, every one of these blocks, there's competing companies that provide the same types of solutions, and all of these types of solutions have come up in some of the earlier presentations that I've heard. You know, at the head end, you're gonna be able to deploy origin, packaging servers, cyclical buffer recorders to do cloud DVR, these types of solutions, all can be deployed in data, uh, in, uh, data centers or in the cloud. To manage that CDN piece of the network, you've got CDN selecting software te technology. Uh, we, we offer something like that, but there's other solutions out there, and these can be used to really leverage and kind of tame that wild beast that is that off-net video delivery network. You also could deploy caching servers at the edge at the network service providers' locations um, to help you know, deliver the best kind of content, quality of experience to your end subscribers. Along that whole path, you can also deploy analytic pieces of software to collect data from all the different providers that are helping you deliver content to your subscribers all at the different points within that off-net video delivery network. Finally, within the home or maybe at the application on someone's phone or a device that they're watching, uh, you can deploy solutions to help with CDN diversity. Uh, maybe some kind of software that can, within a session, go chunk to chunk, packet to packet, CDN to CDN, to always deliver the best video content at that particular time, or maybe the cheapest path, if that's what you choose to, to set up. And then also, uh, within the home or on the end device, you can deploy some kind of library to collect analytic data after a session is concluded to report back and then look at that. Uh, and then you know, look at all the other points of the delivery chain and, and the analytics. So again, this is the off-net video delivery network in rather simplistic terms um, and, and kind of looking at different pieces of it. Um, again, a super powerful thing, uh, but also can be very complicated. There's challenges that, it, you know, that are very prevalent in terms of delivering uh, content off-net. Uh, and I've kind of listed some of the challenges here. If you haven't guessed it already, probably the biggest challenge is that you're using other people's network or the World Wide Web to deliver content to end subscribers. And you know, the quality of experience for your end users is highly dependent upon CDNs and network service providers, and also highly dependent upon their relationship with each other. Uh, we've all heard about content being throttled back or different content being provided, you know, different priority levels. I mean, this is a very real thing that needs to be uh, addressed or at least uh, planned for. Also, live events come with unpredictable costs related to unpredictable peaks in traffic. You know, we've all talked about the Super Bowl experience and, and it's great. I mean, you definitely want people watching your content. And, and, you know, in fact, as engagement of your content goes up, so are your costs. You know, if your engagement is low, your costs are going to be low, but that's not a, that's not a, that's not a problem you want to have. But, uh, and there's also a funny thing they say about OTT networks, and it's that uh, they always work when nobody's watching. But, uh, you know, we, we want to help you and the other people in this room, I sure want to, you know, sure want to help build networks that work and can scale up and down with uh, spikes in traffic. And 
by deploying software along that video network, uh, the off-net video delivery solution, uh, you, you can do that using uh, software modules that use NFV to automatically scale up, to come up with automatic failover solutions, redundancy schemas, et cetera. CDN choice is also a big challenge that you're going to face. One CDN is not always the best at all particular times and all particular locations. I mean, CDNs are great companies and they're always doing their best, but they have different strengths and, and weaknesses or maybe, you know, at, at minute moments in time their networks take a hit, but that means something could happen to your customers. And then again, you know, selecting a mono CDN choice, a lot of people have done this in the past to kind of get going and get going quickly. That's not always the best approach long term. But if you are going to deploy a multi-CDN architecture, you could potentially get fragmented analytics back. So it's, it's a challenge to look at that in a holistic way, to collect all the data from all the different CDNs that you might be employing. And then also, if you are going to be deploying a multi-CDN architecture, it's also uh, you know, a challenge to create that seamless failover. But again, optimizations are possible. So I'd like to just talk about maybe four simple optimizations, some of which have come up in you know, some of the other presentations today already, um, that operators of uh, OTT networks or content providers delivering content OTT uh, can deploy. The first thing that we would recommend is bringing the origin server and packaging back to your own head end, whether that is a data center or a cloud instance. It gives you more control of your content and allows you to you know, you know, manage the content that's being served up to the CDN providers. Second solution that, or optimization that we would recommend would be to deploy uh, multi-CDN architecture, always to make sure that you're using the best CDN at that particular moment in time to deliver content to your subscribers. Third optimization we would recommend would be pushing content out to the edge in terms of using caching solutions. And the fourth one would be to deploy a holistic uh, analytics solution, kind of tying it all together and looking at everything at every single piece of that off-net video delivery chain. So let's quickly look at the first optimization that we mentioned, maybe the first missing ingredient, if, if, if you want to call it that, in terms of delivering a great um, OTT platform. So again, it's hosting the origin server. And in, in this example, we've got an illustration of our origin package deployed in the data center, but it could definitely be deployed in a cloud, public or private serving up uh, content to a mono CDN, and this implies that that CDN is only going to pull the different layers packaged the way that you want it um, for traffic over their network. And then in this example, they're feeding multiple network service providers, which are in turn providing that last mile uh, network to your subscribers. By hosting the origin server, you're also implying that you're bringing the video uh, ingest and encoding in-house as well. And this is another great way to control your own content, to you know, be in the driver's seat. You can set the different layers and profiles and uh, sizes of video that you want to, to create your layers with. Uh, I've spent 20 years basically working for encoder companies. I have firm opinions about some of the best ones out there. But I think operators really want to bring that in-house to control their own destiny and along with that, uh, bring the origin and packaging server in as well. By doing this, you can do multi-format packaging on the fly as you see fit, add new packaging formats you know, whenever you want quite easily. You can add new DRM solutions and applications quite quickly. And also by bringing the origin server in-house, you can also set yourself up for easily doing cloud PBR solutions, catch-up TV, network time shifting, all these applications that customers really love, keep them sticky. And then you can do those in your data center as well, reducing your costs as well. So again, this is the first optimization that we would recommend, and it really sets you up for what the second one is, which is deploying that multi-CDN architecture. In this rather simplistic diagram, we've got an illustration of our CDN selector uh, software module called Umbrella CDN, deployed in a data center, but it could also be deployed in the cloud, virtual or pri uh, public or private. And in this case, serving up uh, content to multiple CDNs, it could be two, three, five, however many you want to throw at a uh, you know, particular uh, a problem, uh, serving multiple network service providers. We can make a further optimization at the edge and deploy a, deploy a optional diversity agent at the application that's playing out the content, again, to uh, look at uh, traffic coming from CDNs packet by packet to always make sure that you're you know, getting uh, the, the best video quality at a packet level um, so that you always have a quality of service that, uh, that you want for your customers. 
So again, by deploying a multi-CDN architecture and software tools to manage it properly, you can allocate CDNs based on different geolocation. Different CDNs are better at different geographic locations than others at different time frames uh, based on their relationship with net different network service providers, different quality of services. I mean, these CDN providers are always trying to do their best and most of the times they're doing an incredible job. Occasionally they might take a hit and if that is the case, uh, you can switch over quickly you know, based on quality of service. You can set up load balancing among several different CDNs. Basically any kind of business rule you could think of, you could implement with this type of software solution. And also using a software solution like this to manage a multi-CDN architecture, you can get centralized analytics, centralized geo-blocking, and just a much better uh, experience managing your multi-CDNs. So a third optimization that we would recommend um, would be to use local cache servers. Um, and you know, this is basically putting a you know, cache solution at the network service provider as close to your customers as possible, uh, you know, one single jump in the network if possible uh, to where they're getting their content. Uh, and by doing this, you're going to increase their startup time, you're gonna reduce buffering time, and you're really gonna improve the overall user experience of your subscribers. Um, so again, deploy these at network service providers locations. You can cache content based on local popularity. Uh, different, popula different content is popular in different areas, different languages, uh, you know, uh, you get the picture. Um, you can also pre-cache content or purge videos quite easily in this type of solution and it works just as well for live as it does for VOD. And then if by chance you happen to exceed the capacity of the caching servers that you deploy at a network service operator, you can always backflow to the CDN as a service and, and use those to serve content up to your subscribers. So that's the third optimization. The fourth optimization we would recommend, again, is kind of pulling it all together and doing a centralized analytics solution. Um, you know, we provide that, other people in this room provide that, but really getting the data from all the different CDN providers you might be using in a multi-CDN architecture, all the different network service providers that are serving up content to your subscribers, and getting information from your subscribers as well by deploying you know, some kind of library at their playout uh, to collect data after a session is concluded to find out what their experience was like, are they a potential to churn later, uh, and then again, also look at you know, which CDN providers performing the best at a particular moment in time, who might be having a problem or not having a problem, what network service provider might be a, a bottleneck where you, know, you might wanna deploy caching solutions. But again, that's the fourth and final optimization we would make to kind of perfect this off-net video delivery uh, solution that is used for OTT. So I won't keep you any longer, hopefully, some of this resonated and is useful. Um, uh, Broadpeak is gonna be here, the remainder of the streaming media show we're exhibiting, or we can answer questions. Uh, then we'll have most of these solutions on demo, but I'm sure Kurt and I would be happy to take any questions that you might have from this presentation today. Thank you for your time.